Well, good evening. Welcome to our evening worship service. We're glad to have you here. Do have a couple of scheduled items coming up over the next few weeks I wanted to mention to you all before we begin our worship service. Uh, tomorrow we have the monthly men's breakfast that's at 9 a.m. So if you're in that category of men and available at 9 a.m., uh, you can see the details there and uh, meet. It's a good opportunity to be able to get together and, and spend some time together. Also, Ladies Bible Study continues on the regular schedule, and as the teens know, we have a youth activity coming up on uh, Friday night at 6 p.m. Uh, we were going to print the calendar, and it was clipping the activities, or the, the items, the event titles, and it stopped right after bad. And uh, so I thought maybe we should adjust to the name or something, and we figured out how to make that work. So um, it's bad bowling, just to clarify, uh, which only has to do with the scoring that we're planning to do. So. Uh, the other item that we did want to bring up, the Easter breakfast is coming up in a few weeks. Um, if you are new to our church since last Easter, uh, you're in good company because Pastor Cameron came last Easter. Uh, so we were excited to uh, celebrate a year uh, with him. But also, uh, we do have a breakfast at 9 a.m., and the items that you can bring are listed there, different categories. Uh, you can bring a dish to share from two of those. And then I did want to note as well that we have no evening service on Easter so just so you are aware, um, that is an open time. And then coming up in a few weeks, there's a baby shower for Caitlin Norton at the end of April. So uh, be aware of those details as well. And one announcement, the elders and deacons did want to request that if you uh, are looking for help with a mission trip uh, for this upcoming summer or camp, um, we would like to uh, have you um, fill out an application and turn that in by next week. So if you don't have a form for that yet, you're welcome to uh, talk with Luann or to me or Pastor Cameron. We can get those forms to you. Email is fine. We just would like to have it filled out and uh, either in hand or in an inbox uh, by next week so that we can get those through uh, process through the leadership meetings. Um, this evening, I'm trying to see, I didn't connect with him before the service. Jonathan? Are you good? We have uh, Jonathan Rose is going to be going on a mission trip, not actually this summer. It's coming up in just a week. And so he is going to share some details about that. So I'm going to have him come up and give us a few details about that. And then we'll uh, pray and continue with our uh, evening service. So Jonathan, come on up. Hi. So I am um, sharing an opportunity that I have through school, and it's to go on a mission trip to Monterey, Mexico. And like Pastor Andrew said, it's next week. Um, we're leaving on Saturday, and then we're coming back on Friday. And there is about 30 of us. We're, it's, a, it's a school trip with... Um, some of the seniors, and we're partnering with Back-to-Back um, -back Ministries, which is an organization that um, works a lot with um, orphans and um, children that have dealt with trauma and um, just helping them. And so we're going to be helping out with one of their homes in Monterey, and we're going to be doing work um, like just maintenance work around the camp and also working with the kids some and um, just trying to show the love of Christ to them. So um, please pray for us if you think of us and um, that we'd be able to minister and um, really display Christ to them and be a difference even if it's only a small one. And then also for safety, um, it's the campus is pretty secure, and it's not a super dangerous part of Mexico, but that's always a concern, especially with the news recently. Um, and then, uh, if you're interested in supporting that at all, then um, if you could write, uh, put, address any checks to my parents, that would help with that. So thank you, and um, I look forward to it. Thank you, Jonathan, for sharing that with us. We'll go ahead and pray for you right now, and uh, we will continue to keep you in prayer over the next few weeks as you prepare uh, to go on this trip and as you go on it, and uh, we'll open our service with prayer. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege that you give us to serve you. 
Thank you for the many opportunities you give us uh, day to day to be able to serve you in the places that you have put us, in the jobs that we have, in the neighborhoods you've placed us in, or the areas uh, that we go frequently, like the grocery store or other places. Thank you for the people that you put in our lives that we cross paths with. And I ask that you would help us to be consistently building relationships and looking for opportunities to share your love with those around us, especially and, and most focused on the gospel and what you have done in sending Jesus to die for us. I pray especially for Jonathan as he has this opportunity to go on a mission trip in a week. Uh, there are a number of things that we have in mind to pray for him, for safety along the way, for opportunities to show your love to the orphans that they're going to spend time with, uh, for growth for him and for those who are on the team as well, that this would be a time in their lives where they uh, see you better through the time that they spend in your word as they fellowship with other believers and as they see the mission that is being carried out there in Monterey. I ask that you would strengthen the, the people there in Monterey as they are preparing for the team to come, and I'm sure they have a number of teams come uh, throughout the year. I pray that you would help them to be prepared uh, to uh, show those who are coming uh, the ministry that you have given them. And I ask that you would work in the hearts of those who go as well, that if this is something that you would call them to minister in or something like this, that you would uh, just help them to see what you have for them in the future. I pray that you would help um, Jonathan and the others over the next week as they prepare uh, to go on the trip, that you would just work out the details of packing, getting things ready, that those would come together, uh, and that you would uh, provide for them financially uh, what is needed to be able to go on the trip. Thank you for the privilege that you give us to praise you, uh, even together, as we have the opportunity to do tonight. I ask that you would help us to be alert and focused on the things that we are singing to you and to one another, and that these things would come from our hearts, not just words that we are uh, familiar with, but that these truths would sink into our hearts and help us to be changed, to be more like you. And I pray that as we read your word, and as we hear your word preached to us, that it would work in us, not even just tonight, but as we continue to think about it throughout the week, that it would be effective to strengthen us for the things that you have given to us to do this week. In Christ's name, amen. I'm excited for Jonathan, the special opportunity that he has coming up. And he gets to uh, go out and live out this plea, this call that we are going to sing about in our first hymn. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus, ready, stands to save you. It's a special mo moment that he has to be able to do this. I ask if you're able, please stand as we start by singing hymn number 338. Come ye sinners, poor and needy. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of mercy, love and power. I will rise and go to Jesus, he will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand times. Come ye thirsting from and welcome God's free bounty glorified to believe and true repentance every grace that brings you not God will rise and go to Jesus he will embrace me in his arms in the arms of God our Savior oh there are ten thousand times come ye weary heavy laden lost in
You may be seated. Scripture reading is from Psalm 51. To the choir master, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Our hymn before the message comes again from our hymnal, number 284, Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
We're going to be in James chapter 4 tonight, so I invite you to turn there in your Bible. And as we do, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can stand beneath the cross of Jesus. We are made so aware of our unworthiness, Lord, when we look on Jesus Christ. Uh, we realize that it's our own sins that placed Him on that tree. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And while we were enemies with You, God, You reconciled us to Yourself through the work of Your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to marvel at the cross and then to find our glory in Jesus Christ. Even as we look at the truth of these words, God, I pray, please help us to humble ourselves as we realize the depth of your love and the depth of our sin and discover that your mercy runs far greater than anything we could comprehend. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been studying through the book of James on Sunday nights when I've been preaching and We've really come to the heart of this book in chapter 4. Verses 1 through 6 in chapter 4 told us that our war with God would never end until we embraced humility. And then we got to the theme of the book. Look in verse 6. It says in verse 6 of James 4, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble, then the next question we should ask is, how can I embrace humility? We should all desire this, and that's what the next four verses are about. They t teach us that we must learn to embrace humility. Verses 7 through 10 are kind of like a book. Verse 7 is the cover of the book with the title, and it gives you the idea of what to expect. Notice it says in verse 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submission here literally means to put in order under. It means I recognize God's authority and I place myself under Him. If I want to be a humble person and not harden myself in pride, and in rebellion, I must do this. I must submit myself to God. Then every command that follows will include some kind of act of submission that places ourselves under God. Then look at verse 10, the end of this section. It's kind of like the back of a book. Sometimes you'll look at the back cover on a book and it gives a quick summary of the book and how it will help you so you feel motivated to read what's inside. Verse 10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and here's the glory, here's the encouragement, and He will exalt you. And that's an encouraging promise for us. If we're going to read this how-to manual on humility, if we're going to put into practice this command to submit ourselves to God, then God says in the end He'll deal with our exaltation. We can trust Him. So let's find out how we humble ourselves. In this how-to manual on humility, the first thing that we need to do to embrace humility is we embrace humility by resisting Satan and returning to God. James gives us two commands that are really parallel to each other. One is negative, and then one is positive. And both commands have a promise attached to them if we obey. And here's the first command and promise. If you stand up to Satan, you will send him running. Notice the command in verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. To resist means to stand against. And we see clearly what this looks like in Ephesians chapter 6. There it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth 
and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation then the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Now simply notice here that our resistance to Satan is not anchored in ourselves. The command in this text is to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. We are to put on the armor of God, not our own armor. It's anchored in what God has done and the gifts that He has given to us by His Holy Spirit. And as you follow that command, as you resist Satan, the promise is that he will flee from you. Recently, Emily and I have been working to clean out our garage. I call it the final frontier in our home. Since we moved in last year, there have been lots of areas that we've worked to clean out, and the garage is the final frontier. And when we go in to clean out the garage, and you flick on the light and pull things back, sometimes you discover a wonderful bug, the palmetto bug cockroaches and what happens when you flip on a light when cockroaches are around they scatter they don't like being exposed to the light and here we see the same is true of the devil when we resist him when we expose him to the armor of god and the weapons of spiritual warfare he scatters every time this is a promise that you can claim there's no qualifications It's not like this works half the time. This is a clear promise from God you can fully trust. So resist Satan like you are supposed to resist your own sinful flesh, which is what James said earlier. And even if Satan attacks you, you can know for certain that God will send Satan running. So we're promised in 1 John chapter 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So Satan will flee if you resist him with God's weapons. This is the good news. But there's even better news. The Bible is more than just negative commands. It's not just don't do this, don't do that. No, as you resist the devil, God gives you a positive command that you can embrace. It says in verse 8, if you return to God, he will welcome you. Notice it, verse 8, draw near to God and drawing near to God carries with it the idea in the Old Testament of the priests who would approach God in the tabernacle or in the temple with their offerings they were a special group of people designated by God to come before him to worship and the high priest was the most important of all the priests on the day of atonement he would come and offer sacrifices for the sins of the nation before God But for us today, we know that we do not need an earthly priest. The book of Hebrews tells us that our great high priest is Jesus Christ. And the way that you embrace humility is by drawing near through Christ before the throne of grace so that you may obtain mercy and find help in time of need. This idea of drawing near to carries with it the idea of returning. What could we possibly be? be returning from well we think of the prodigal son who came to himself as he's eating from the pig slop and in his rebellion and his sin against god he recognizes and he realizes that it was way better at home with the father and so he returns to the father and if you and i are going to humble ourselves before god we need to return to him and it's never the other way around God didn't go anywhere. He didn't run from us. We're the ones who forsook him. And what is God's response when we return to him? Notice the promise. It says, if we return to God, if we draw near to him in verse 8, he will draw near to you. Think of the prodigal son. When he returned The father saw him and it says, well, he was still a long way off. He felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. God is ready to welcome you with arms of grace when you return to him from your sin. 
When you return to God, God will say, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. If we embrace humility by resisting the devil and returning to God, God will welcome you with open arms. But you have to come on his terms. You have to submit yourself to his command to resist the devil and return to God. But what does it look like to return to God? James is going to tell us exactly what he means when he says draw near to God. Then another pair of brief and blunt commands. James is very much to the point, And really these commands are meant to shock us. They're meant to shock us into understanding that we can only embrace humility through total repentance. These words literally read like this at verse 8. Wash hands, sinners. Purify hearts, double-minded. We read in our text, he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's a spiritual one-two punch. It's like the staccato jerk that grabs us by the collar and says, wake up, wake up. Don't miss this. You must totally repent of your sin. And how do we do that? Well, total repentance is marked by a changed life. You know, the washing of hands was an act of ritual purity in the Old Testament. Obviously, it's something external that you can do and you can see. God commanded it in the Old Testament as an outward symbol of the internal washing from sin that we all needed. We all need. But why would we wash our hands if we've already been washed from our sins isn't that the old testament stuff well basically james is referring to this symbolism as a call to us to change our ways change your life isaiah 1 16 says this wash yourselves make yourselves clean remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes cease to do evil What's interesting is that in the space of just a few verses, James has called his readers adulteresses back in verse 4, and then here, sinners, and then he calls them double-minded. I mean, why? Because of what they were doing. They were sinning. And yet, at the same time, James, in this letter, has called them my brothers and my beloved brothers. What is this bizarre behavior The good cop, bad cop routine? My brother, sinner. My beloved, adulteresses. So which one is it? The paradox that we must wrestle with is, yes, we are saints, but we're also sinners. We're forgiven sinners, and we've been washed, but we still need daily cleansing. There is still sin in our lives that we must root out and change and grow from. So Jesus could tell his disciples, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you in John chapter 15. And at the same time, even though his disciples were clean, Jesus said he still needed to wash their feet. Remember when he said to Peter or Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. There's this clear idea in the New Testament that though we are forgiven and we are justified, we still need daily cleansing and sanctification from our sin. We're all still growing. Now, this is really important to remember. You may meet some people who claim that they are saved. They may say that they've trusted in Jesus, but really it's our responsibility to press in a little bit further and ask the question, what are you saved from? Because sometimes you'll get responses like, I'm saved from hell, or I'm just trusting in Jesus to guide my life. But what is missing from all of those answers? Sin. Any need of repentance and confession of our sin, which is what alienates us from God. Ultimately, our greatest need is to be saved from our sin. We are sinners saved by grace. And every day we need to be less of a sinner and more of a saint by God's grace. And that's the key here. If I submit myself underneath God's authority, I realize that total repentance includes a change in the way that I live. It is marked by a changed life, and that external change is rooted in an even deeper internal change. 
Notice second, that total repentance isn't just marked by a changed life. It's marked by a purified heart. The life changes because the heart changes. So notice the second command. He says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. And this warns us that we can indeed be the double-minded man that James mentioned in chapter 1. And the solution to double-mindedness is heartfelt repentance, sincerity in your soul. Because it's possible to put on fake repentance, isn't it? We can fake repentance for lots of reasons. Young people, you might fake repentance in an effort to please your parents or to avoid getting in trouble with your teachers or to get on the good side of your friends. As adults, we get better at this. We can say the right words to get what we want. We can even do the right things for a little while to get what we want. But our heart hasn't changed and God isn't fooled. And Jesus had some choice words for people who feigned repentance. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup. He's talking about their heart (coughs) and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. (coughs) Jeremiah also points out people like this in Jeremiah chapter 5. He says, run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Look and take note. Search her squares to see if you can find a man, one who does justice and seeks truth, that I may pardon her. Though they say, as the Lord lives, yet they swear falsely. O Lord, do not your eyes look for truth? You have struck them down, but they felt no anguish. You have consumed them, but they refused to take correction. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. That is a terrible place to be when we refuse to repent because God wants a changed heart and he won't settle for anything less. So he tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So what we find is that true repentance comes from an undivided heart, sincerely laying out our sins before the Lord and asking for his forgiveness. And if we don't truly repent, our heart is going to be like that character in the Lord of the Rings. You remember him, Smeagol or Gollum? One side, he's wanting to help the hobbits, trying to do nice for them. The other side, he gets upset and turns. He's plotting to kill them on one side, being nice on the other, constantly flipping back and forth like a double-minded man. You will not be stable in your ways. You'll be hearing but not doing. You'll be blessing God but cursing others. And your war in your heart will spill out into a war with others. But God is jealous for you. He wants your hands and your heart. So go for total repentance. James has gotten really specific, hasn't he? There's really no wiggle room here for us to redefine humility. If we embrace humility by resisting Satan and then returning to God, and then that return from God means that we will totally repent both hands and heart. And it's really that simple, but it's not that easy. In fact, it's really hard to do this sometimes. So how do we find the motivation to embrace humility? Well, James says that we embrace humility by responding appropriately to our sin. We recognize it for what it is and respond appropriately. You know, James has already driven really hard to this point, but he's not done yet. He's going now to describe to us a practice that is really foreign to a lot of modern day Christians. He's going to describe to us the practice of Middle Eastern mourning. Why would we mourn? Because our sin is great. When we recognize what it does towards God, it will break our hearts. So we need to recognize, first of all, the depth of our sin in verse 9. James commands us to do three things that all have slightly different meanings in this process of mourning. They're all mourning, but they have slightly different emphasis. Notice verse 9. He says, be wretched. This verb has the idea of becoming something we're not. 
when we realize just how serious our sin is and that we are at war with God and with others, the appropriate response is shame and grief. It's from the arrogance of our sin to the shame and grief of it. As we realize our sin, we feel wretched. We're not proud of it. We feel dirty. We feel distressed. It's like, ah, what have I done? And that's an appropriate response. We should feel that way about our sin. And in, in all the same moment, this is both a beautiful and a terrible feeling because it's on the beginning steps of repentance and yet we're feeling horrible about our sin. We need to be cut to our heart and realize our sin has offended a holy God. It's what we need. And when God convicts us of sin, we could expect to mourn. Notice the next one. It says, be wretched and mourn. That's simply expressing sorrow over your sin. It meditates on and regrets what has been lost, what has been destroyed, and what has been damaged by sin. And we find examples in the Old Testament of what it means to mourn over sin. Ezra, when he saw faith missing from God's people, mourned in Ezra chapter 10. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Jehohanan. Uh Can't even pronounce it. I repent. The son of Eliashib, where he spent the night, neither eating bread nor drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithlessness of the exiles. That's pretty serious. Isaiah, when he saw a vision of the Holy Lord in his temple, cried out. We saw this when Aaron Coffey was here. He preached on this. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then we get to the book of Corinthians, and Paul rebukes the people from Corinth because they're tolerating an arrogant person in their midst who is sinning in the church. And he says, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Dear Christians, sin destroys so much. Sin stains so much. And sin breaks our relationship with God. So if mourning over your sin is not a part of your life, then you really haven't been that convicted by it. Sin is not like some dirt from the garden that we wash off our hands. No, it's a permanent marker stain on a new dress or a polo shirt. It's a problem that we can't remove. And once we realize that, James tells us that we should weep over our sin. And I think it's at this point that we really start losing touch as 21st century Christians with uh, these commands What God expected of his people in the Old Testament is that they would weep outwardly because of their sin. So God calls for it in Joel chapter 2. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. And perhaps the problem is We don't resonate with this because we just haven't become as serious about our sin as we should. There were other reasons people wept in the Bible. What were some other reasons they cried? Because God sent Israel into exile and the people mourned bitterly over their loss. Listen to Zechariah 11. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, for the glorious trees are ruined. Wail, oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has been felled. The sound of the wail of the shepherds, for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions for the thicket of the Jordan is ruined. In wartime, people weep because wartime is vicious. It's heartrending. When else do people weep? In death. The loss of a loved one. These are dark moments defined by sin. Sin causes war. Sin causes death. How would you feel if you walked out of the church tonight into the parking lot and you discovered that someone had keyed your car? What I mean by that is they took a car key and they started at the front of your car, stuck it on the car and scratched it all the way down the length of the body of your vehicle. Then they went around to the other side and scratched it all the way across. How'd you feel? 
pretty upset, right? We have a lot of emotions there. What, how would you feel if you went out and discovered that and you looked over and you saw that the next person to you had the same thing happen to their vehicle and the next and the next? We'd be pretty upset, right? You'd probably hear a lot of noise out in the parking lot as people shared the information with each other. How do we feel about our sin? Sin causes far more damage than a scrape on a vehicle. Do you feel that way about the damage your sin causes in your life and the lives of those around you? You know, this is not the kind of weeping that just comes up from being caught in our sin or dealing with the consequences of our sin. You know, if we get caught, that comes as a result of our sin. And if we get punished, that comes as a result of our sin. But what God wants us to be concerned about is the sin itself and what it does to our relationship with God and others, not just the punishments from it. So we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death And there's a really good example of this in the New Testament of someone who really grieved unto repentance. That's Peter. He messed up. He was so bold and so brazen in his commitment to the Lord, said, I will never fail you. I'm always going to follow you. And then, just like Jesus said, Peter failed. And it says, and he went out and wept bitterly. Peter betrayed Christ. Then he knew what that meant. He was an unfaithful friend in his Lord's darkest hour. Would you have wept bitterly? Would I have wept bitterly? To embrace humility, we need to respond appropriately by recognizing the depth of our sin. That's not comfortable, but it is real. It's true to the reality of sin. And if we do this, we will also replace superficial joy with serious sorrow. Look at the second half of the verse. Notice in verse 9, it says, Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And you might be like, well, thank you, Johnny Stormcloud. I didn't come here tonight to have some depressing sermon launched upon me. What is wrong with you, Pastor Cameron? I mean, doesn't Paul tell us in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord? Doesn't Nehemiah tell us the joy of the Lord is your strength? Well, yes, But there are different kinds of weeping and there are different kinds of laughter in this world. You realize you can be peppy and happy-go-lucky and still live in sin? There can be a kind of joy and laughter that's superficial that is not rooted in repentance. You can put on a joyful air and still live in your sin and we do this all the time. Here's a good example. Maybe you've seen this before or perhaps been guilty of it yourself. You're at home with the kids. It's like, okay, you be quiet right now. If I get this attitude from you one more time, phone rings. Oh, hello. Oh, yes, things are going well today. Oh, the kids. Oh, the kids are just being how kids are. You know how it goes. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, we'll talk to you later. Bye. Beep. And we really need to watch out for this. I mean, superficial emotions that cover up the real problems that are going on underneath. And this verb is in the passive. It says, let your laughter be turned to mourning, which means you need to be open to God changing your heart in this matter. Are you willing to let God make you mourn over your sin? Jesus said, woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. But the good news is, Jesus also said in the same chapter, in Luke chapter 6, blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And this is the encouraging news for those who are willing to humble themselves and to mourn and to repent over their sin. God promises that he will lift that kind of person up. He will allow you to enjoy the blessings of repentance. And so, as we see in the final point, James tells us to embrace humility, to enjoy the reward of God's grace. Joy is in sight. True, rich, meaningful joy. Not superficial, empty laughter. How do we get it? How do we get that kind of real joy? 
Humility. Humility is key. James has been hammering away at this theme of humility. Now he's come full circle. We're at the back cover of the book, and he summarizes everything he just said in verse 10. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. That's it. That's the key to the whole book of James, and that's the key to the point that he's been working to in in the Christian life. If we humble ourselves before God, be willing to confess and repent of our sin, he will give us joy. So we can humble ourselves knowing this. The reward is totally worth it. It's not a fun process, but the reward is worth worth it. James doesn't say exactly how God will exalt us, But I think there's lots of hints in the Bible. One of the things is restoration of true joy and laughter. You know, when David repents of his sin with Bathsheba, we read about it tonight. In Psalm 51, he cries, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. I mean, that's what we really want. We want joy in the Lord. And in Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah tells the people to move on from being sorrowful. He says, you don't need to stay here anymore. You can actually rejoice. They needed to realize that the Lord was sufficient to meet their need, even in their failure. So he says, Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. They saw their sin, and it was appropriate mourning. And he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved. Here's the verse. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. That verse comes in the context of people who have repented, So yes, repent from your sin, but don't dwell on it. It's been said that for every look at ourself, we should take 10 looks towards Christ because of his forgiveness. Jesus himself promises us in Matthew 5, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, God has many ways of exalting people. They might come in the form of a new opportunity Expected form of praise or something else. Like in the story of Esther. Haman was supposed to be hung on the gallows that he, or Haman was hung on the gallows that he built for Mordecai. And Mordecai was rewarded with the honor that Haman thought he was requesting for himself. Haman had to uh, bring him all the way through the city, proclaiming Mordecai's praises. But in the end, the best rewards are the spiritual ones. The reward of having a right relationship with God and enjoying Christ for eternity. So as we close, I just want us to consider three stories in the New Testament where Jesus illustrates this truth. I also want you to ask yourself this question. Who was humble and who was proud in the story? Here's the first one in Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do, not, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and, are, and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So who was humble and who was proud, according to Jesus? Second story. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. 
And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Who was humble and who was proud in this story? Luke chapter 18. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's quoting David. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So who was humble? And who was proud in all those stories? You have to look a little more closely in the second story out of those three, but in every single case, they were the religious leaders. They were the ones who were supposed to be closest to God. The spiritual ones. And yet they didn't even know how to embrace humility. That's a lesson for us. That's a warning. You know, we can be religious or we can be spiritually minded people we think of ourselves. You might be a spiritual leader, like a pastor, like me. You may serve God. But do you know, do I know how to embrace humility? Do we do it? We are not spiritually mature unless we do. I have for you one last example, and this is the best example, the positive example of humility in all the Bible. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He's telling the Philippians how to be united, how to have unity. They have to have one mindset. And what is that mindset that unifies the church? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't hang on to his right to sit in heaven's throne room. Instead, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He stepped down and became a human. And then he did even more. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. He, comes, he becomes a man and then he dies. And it's not just any death. What kind of death is it? Even death on a cross. Humiliation. And then exaltation. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, here's the name God gives him, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus paves the way for us in doing this. Even though he had no sin, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And because he did that, the Father exalts him and gives him title, Lord of all. I was once at commencement at Bob Jones to watch a friend graduate. And if you've seen it before, you know that they've allowed students to give testimonies. As the students on one side of the platform are streaming through to grab their diplomas, on the other side, some have come and lined up and they start sharing their testimonies of how God has worked during their time at the school. And there was one particular student who stepped up to the microphone 
and the, like, a whole section of the audience just started cheering. And he kind of like accepted the accolades. He's like, thank you, thank you. And then, in a split second, to his great embarrassment and shame, he realized that the whole section was not cheering for him. It was cheering for a student who was just now getting their diploma. And in the same moment, everybody in the auditorium suddenly realized they weren't cheering for him either. They were cheering for these people. And so what turned from a moment of praise and accepting adulation and accolades turned into a moment of shame and great embarrassment. That's a picture of what happens when we step in front of Christ. When we try to accept the praise that's intended only for Jesus. When we humble ourselves and we seek to confess our sin and follow hard after Christ, God will take care of us. He'll give us joy beyond all measure. And He'll exalt us in whatever way He sees fit. So, seek the rewards that flow from humility. Seek the joy that comes from Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, all of us need this. There's not a single person in this room who has it all put together. There's not a single person in this room who does not struggle with pride in one area or another in their life. Lord, this is for all of us. And it's not comfortable, Lord, but it is good. Because in these truths, Lord, you are teaching us to take a more serious view of our sin and a truer view of joy. Lord, we are so tempted with so many different just vain and empty pleasures in this life. The world would have us to run from one form of entertainment or distraction or diversion that makes us happy for a fleeting moment to another. To so our joy is so shallow so many times. I pray, God, please help us to realize that The ones who mourn and weep over their sin are the ones who truly have joy. Help us to find deep, abiding, lasting joy by obeying these commands here that James has been driving us to, that we would humble ourselves before you, Lord, so in due season, you will lift us up. We place ourselves at your disposal this week, Lord. Please help us to be quick to confess our sin, quick to run to you, and quick to give the glory to Christ so that you may be exalted. In the end, Lord, if you exalt us to any measure of some position or praise or joy or whatever it may be, God, we give you the credit for that too. We lay our crowns at your feet because you are worthy of all the honor and the glory and the praise. So we give this to you tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight comes again from our hymnal number 469. I hope it's a plea, a desire of everyone's heart, these words that we're about to sing, that it not be us, but Christ, that is honored, love exalted. If you're able, please stand as we end or conclude our service with not I, but Christ.
you are dismissed.